thank you both for being here, joining me for this, for this talk. I'm super nervous, super excited. Um, it's a very interesting topic and obviously having both of you guys um, committing and giving me your time and your wisdom is something phenomenal and unforgettable for me. So most welcome and thank you again. Um, so hi out there to everyone who's joining. Um, this is going to be one of our really exciting exchange between some wonderful people. So um, happy I could make that manageable and um, happening for you guys. Um, my name is Jam. Um, I'm going to moderate this uh, round table. You guys know me as the founder and CEO of Neural Jam. Um, I have both Michelle and Jeffrey as our advisory board members. We've been working on some fascinating concepts and I asked them to expand on it a little bit today with us. And so we're gonna have a discussion around self-organized learning and agile learning organizations to, you know, uh, explore a little bit of the tip of this huge iceberg and um, have you guys going back home with some insights and inspirations, hopefully. So um, before we start, um, Michelle and Jeffrey, I'd like to have you guys um, introduce yourselves. Um, Michelle, shall we start with you? Tell us a little bit about your passion and who you are and, mm -hmm. and we take it from there. Yeah, thank you, Jem. Uh, happy to be here and join in into this uh, hopefully very interesting discussion. Uh, I'm Michelle Newland, learning expert for over 35 years in that field. Um, started with um, the learning experience and learning journey from a very early age. So um, even before studies and even before work, I've already been um, yeah, encouraging in, in topics of learning, become a learning specialist in that field. And um, especially nowadays, uh, looking into agile transformations and the question, what kind of learning culture do we need in order to transform? Thank you. Perfect. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm sure we're going to hear more about that. Uh, Jeffrey, what is in your court? Well, Jam, first and foremost, it is uh, just delightful to be here with you and Michelle and with our folks with us online. Uh, my name is Jeffrey Rayford. I'm on the faculty at Harvard Business School. I'm part of the Entrepreneurial Management Unit, a department dedicated to entrepreneurships, both startups and scale-up ventures. Uh, what I do at the school uh, is uh, deep dedication to something that I know will be core to our conversation, which is around how to adults, in our case, MBA students and executives, how do they learn and what happens in our classrooms that make those very powerful environments for that. My specific stream of research these days is around technology companies and asking the question, how do they get from small to big? We know a lot about how you stand up a startup, the zero to one lean methodology, product market fit thing and all of that. And of course, we as business schools have a hundred years worth of glorious knowledge and insight around how to manage enterprise at scale. But this issue of how you get from a startup to enterprise scale is uh, an understudied issue, especially when you're on an exponential top line growth curve. Uh, and that's often what one encounters in tech. So that's what I spend a lot of my time doing these days, Jam and Michelle, and really, as Michelle said, looking forward to this discussion. Awesome, super cool. So um, let me give you guys a context before I start asking you to, uh, to uh, dive a bit deeper. Um, so as you guys know, um, I am dedicated to further education for over 25 years now. And um, I do remember, and I was mentioning that to friends uh, just recently, I was really intelligent and good at school, but at some age of, I don't know, 16 or 17, I was like becoming so lazy and naughty. And I was like kind of trying to skip school and going to the cinema and party around. And, and I was at the edge of um, failing almost all subjects. So the director of the school dragged me into his office and kind of complained like how such intelligent person could uh, neglect the school and everything. And I was trying to be um, smart and told him, well, you know, uh, the problem is that you guys are dictating us what to learn. I don't need that. I don't want you to tell me what to learn. 
show me how to learn and leave it to me and I do the rest. And if you don't believe me, I will prove it to you in the next month. I will do all the exams I've failed and show you if I know the how I can learn faster. And the bet was on and I did within one month of summer, I rewrote all the exams and I passed all of them. Um, so, I mean, I didn't know what I said at that time, but like almost 30 years later, I realized like, oh, that was clever, or at least pretending to be clever. Um, and recently, as I was talking to you, Michelle, you made me realize that if 30 years ago, I thought it's not about what to learn and it's about how to learn. Mm. Even the question of how to learn is now becoming um, no longer that valid question because the how is so different for different people. And having been in the education of adults and corporates for many years now, I'm um, starting to realize so how did they manage to survive so far? Why did it work? Uh, or wasn't it working the whole time and it was always a little bit of kind of waste in the background and a little bit of waste of time and money and resources and everything? Uh, but it was the way corporate were dealing with it. And um, so that's why I would like to jump into that whole, um, you know, exercise and question of um, is the way corporate approaching further development of their people and the people development um, a standard which could be supported and remain established? Or is it really an urge we can talk about in terms of changing the culture of learning so um that's the angle i'm trying to take um and since the words we are using are partially buzzwords mm -hmm. let's start with a fundamental question uh, because the word agile has been used so often in the last couple of years so what do you guys think and please feel free whoever wants can pick up the mic um so what do you guys think what is agile learning to you and what is self-organized learning to you? Um, um, whether you want to go from a definition or a cultural perspective, I'm open to that. Michelle, why don't you start on that one? Okay, yeah, thank you, Tam. Um, agile learning is the question of learning ability and being able to learn fast and efficient. So being agile, in terms of learning means I identify what I need to learn. I can organize myself and learn it quite fast and quick with a good result. So that that's basically agile learning, the ability to learn fast with good results. And why is it important? Because our environment, our society is changing so fast. So there is no deal of learning for the next two, three, four, five, six years like we've done previously. So we've made a plan, development plan, said, okay, these are the abilities that we need. We've tried to you know, look into the future and say, okay, that's, that's actually what we need to learn. And then we've you know, made a development plan and developed the people according to the plan from what we thought would be necessary and important to do. So, and, and that's changing. It's changing so rapidly in terms of fast changing surroundings, fast changing um, society, fast changing um, even topics that we have nowadays. So we need to be able to learn fast, but not only that, we also need to learn how to relearn or unlearn. And that's another thing. So we, you know, the, the um, duration of our knowledge is becoming shorter and shorter because it's increasing also in in, in terms of um, yeah fast changing knowledge so we also need to be able to unlearn far faster than we used to jeffrey how do you see this yes um, just to, to build on, on michelle's point jim I, I think it may be worth reminding us and all of the folks with us you know that the agile learning is a metaphor that was transferred from the world of software development and the alternative to agile software development is of course called waterfall development mm -hmm. and maybe it's worth saying that it's not as if waterfall has been completely invalidated mm -hmm. um, that is that if we were in the business of building a hydroelectric dam 
or a nuclear reactor, some very large project in which there would not be much dynamism in the exogenous variables and all the givens were known and the nature of the demand pattern was the same now as what we projected with high confidence five years marking up for growth and 10 years from now. Um, those big complex industrial builds, they still do waterfall development, waterfall figuratively for the brick and mortar build, but certainly for the software build. And agile became a very big thing in the context of tech ventures, especially when they're developing software and apps for consumer markets where tastes were changing all the time, where you didn't actually know that you were, you didn't know whether you wanted to build a hydroelectric dam or nuclear reactor. You didn't know what you were building really, because you were going to put something quick and dirty, a minimum viable in the market and do so-called in market, find out what the world actually wanted. And based on that market feedback, then Agile has the flexibility, as Michelle says, to pivot from one position to another, maybe even to completely redefine and reinvent what you're building at five different points during the build process, what's famously known as a pivot. Um, I think it's worth saying that that what, what makes this such a big deal in learning and education is that um, there might have been a time in, in human history when the world was stable enough that you could imagine that you could say, five years from now, I want you to know X, Y, and Z, and I'm gonna map out the next five years of your curriculum, and I'm gonna write a bunch of lectures, and we get a bunch of superannuated faculty members who will show up with notes they've been reading from for 30 years, and they'll give the same lectures over and over again, sort of the Heidelberg model of education from half a millennium ago. There may have been a time, although I think probably all of us would be skeptical about that, but there was certainly a time when humans believed that the world had that level of stability and predictability, mm -hmm. and therefore, that kind of a, a set educational program. Here are the things that you will need to know, and I've got four years or five years to get you to know them. And that mm -hmm. might have made sense. Um, clearly, the world is much more volatile and dynamic today, much to our chagrin, and you know, mostly black swan events that seem to be happening much more frequently than black swan events should be happening. But to bring it all the way back, Jam, to your question, the thing that is inarguable is that there's not a business in the world, certainly not uh, in the spaces related to digital tech, to generative AI, to biotech and life sciences. All of these worlds are being fueled by innovation. All of them are exploring the unknown. All of them are focused on bringing new products and services, often disruptive or discontinuous to market. All of them require continuous learning just because these are complex things and we are inventing how we build them as we build them. Um, oh, and by the way, there's a market, there's a customer, and nobody ever said the customer didn't have a, have a right to change her mind. Um, so for all those reasons, it would be hard to believe that any kind of corporate training program that was done in Heidelberg Method would make a lot of sense, unless we were talking about the most baseline, you know, compliance issues around regulatory harassment, et cetera, in which case maybe it would. But then there's one other problem, and I'll end here, is that the problem with the waterfall method in education is not just that people's needs change because the world changes, but that it's incredibly boring. And I say this with no disrespect. It's just that occasionally you find an incredibly charismatic faculty member could talk to you for three hours and everyone is glued to every last word. But in general, adults learn through interaction. Adults learn through surprise and humor and give and take and debate. And so force feeding broadcast mode, even if you're 100% confident about the content, is probably the wrong medium to deliver the message. And certainly among for, for busy people whose hair is on fire in the context of businesses that are changing every day, it seems absolutely crazy to believe that a less engaging methodology for teaching and learning would have any place in the workplace at all. Makes totally sense. I, I, I totally get it. So uh, in, I have, uh, um, you make me sidetrack now because <laughs> a lot of items you are uh, putting on the table um, uh, opens new doors to, to other subject matters. So um, the first thing jumped in my head right now, and I just mentioned that as a point, we can park it aside, uh, is that so if we are, if you're talking about um, transforming or remodeling the um, adult education, the corporate education, um, then I'm starting to think that might actually um, be a message to go back all the way and start changing the fundamental, uh, you know, how to have children even at school learn, because if they learn it that way there, by the time they come to the corporate world, they have already that and we don't need to go 
for re-educating them from the culture perspective and giving them a new understanding for it. Um, because this is the question I want to go and lead towards. I'm, I'm trying to think um, one of the obstacles we're going to have is, Michelle, you just mentioned like, you know, it's when people start learning how to learn fast or the aspects you, Jeffrey, mentioned. So all of that, I'm putting myself in the shoes of a corporate management team where we go there and say, you know what, <clears throat> we need to spend a considerable amount of time and money and resources of your organization to slow you down from productivity and <laughs> turn you into a better organized organization in terms of learning so that you have mid and long term um, added value. And um, and then I wonder like, OK, so if if these guys have been uh, properly educated about this years before, they would have had not this question or problem at all. They would go there as a self-understanding. So maybe a next generation yep. is uh, coming and deal with this agile learning in a totally different way because they learn it from, from scratch. But so assuming we are facing a company who understands the value but knows that their individuals are mentally ready for it because when you say, Michelle, oh it's it's all about learning how to learn fast and all of that questions you said sounded easy but i think people would say what do you mean like how can i do it so um is it a cultural issue and do we need need to develop a understanding before that like a culture before we can apply some some methodology and processes in place that uh, promote agile and self-organized learning? Yeah, it's, it's very much a cultural approach. First of all, we need to understand that learning and working are one. We used to separate the two. So we used to say, okay, that's your learning path. Then we thought about that's your working path. And we had a lot of thoughts in terms of learning transfers or how do we transfer what we've learned into the workspace and we need to stop this. So we need to think it completely different. So thinking of learning and working as one and we need to learn while we work and not separate the two and then try to, you know, establish something that brings those two paths together. So that's a different thinking, first of all, before we even think about culture and the cultural approach and learning mm -hmm. like you've said very much in the beginning you know if i know what is my work about where are my problems where do we need to develop and i identify that for myself and within my team i am the owner and the driver of my learning experience and i do know very much so that you know where's the need of our team where's my personal need and keeping responsible for that and taking that responsibility into my own hands instead of waiting for someone else to tell me what I what do I need to learn and what does the company want me to learn or so or my my leader tells me what I need to learn. So this is taking ownership for your own learning journey. And that's a complete different approach. So you need to have a mindset for that before we start, you know, teaching technology and techniques and, and anything else. So yes, it's a cultural change. And it's a mind shift that we need to have there in, in terms of, you know, preparing people and and all our workforce, well, not only workforce, everyone. Mm -hmm. um, becoming an agile learner means taking over responsibility and creating the ability to learn and identify how do I identify my learning goals? How do I shape my journey? How do I shape the journey together with my team? And how do I identify what we actually need to learn? Mm -hmm. So that needs to come back into the responsibility of an adult person. So you know, we're not trying to be, you know, there's someone knowing something better about me than I do or our team. And this needs to change. So that's a, definitely it's a mindset that we need to develop in terms of that. And um, definitely a culture in terms of understanding that learning and working is one and that we need to develop it within the workspace so we don't need to separate the two and further on encourage learning as a curiosity and anything else so you know that has 
different implications if you look at into leadership. That means, you know, a leader also needs to be showing up as someone who learns, but also understands that learning is part of working nowadays. And you can't really separate saying, okay, that's the productive part. And there, there, there you have your little learning time, let's say two to four days a, a year or something. And then the rest, you know, then you're going to be productive again. So that's a different approach. Yeah, I understand. Um, I have a question for you, Jeffrey, on that, because it's a really interesting and I'm not, um, um, like native in German language, so I might be mistaking this, but there is this word in German called Unternehmertum, which I mm -hmm. translate entrepreneurial, like entrepreneurship. Uh, entrepreneurship, yeah. Mm -hmm. And um, like I have often clients in Germany who come to me and say, um, can you help me to uh, turn my employees to be more um, Unternehmer, like to have the culture of Unternehmertum, so the culture of entrepreneurship. Mm. In those cases, I'm often realizing that the CEO who is asking me that question wants their employees to become more, um, um, say, um, stepping forward to take more responsibility. Mm. And um, the expectations sometimes really go into, oh, if I manage to turn my people to have this entrepreneurial mindset, then maybe they don't only stay here from nine to five. And if they do one more hour, they feel it's almost like it is my own company and do so, you know, is a hidden way of getting people involved with their heart and soul into an organization and say, well, if you would have been an entrepreneur, you would act different, mm -hmm. even if you don't have anything at stake here and it's just a job with a salary. Yes. Now, um, how I have been using the word entrepreneur and entrepreneurial mindset in the last few years at least was always connected to the startup scene and to the innovation and it was more about a set of um you know a set of behaviors such as take risks and be able to um quickly take decisions and let ideas fall and kill them if you have to so that you can move forward never give up so um i'm, I'm thinking right now if we go into an organization and say, we are here to help you to um, transform yourself into a um, agile learning culture, um, how close or far is it to go and say, we are here to transform your organization to become more of an entrepreneurial mindset organization? Is it mm. like the same or is it like kind of covering one another or supporting one another? You answer this first, and then I have an answer, a uh, like question from um, the audience to yeah. attach to that as well. Okay. Yeah, I, it's, I, I, I think, Jamma, it strikes me it's a wonderful question. And uh, all, all I can say is I resonate deeply with the spirit of it in a bit of a different way, which is that, um, you know, because of the kind of research I do, and a lot of it is, is based in case writing, so field-based research, um, it is a good way to meet hundreds of folks who are brilliant entrepreneurs and get to know them and, and, and what drives them. And all I can say is that if there is one trait, you know, aside from the obvious, which is these tend to be <laughs> more aggressive rather than passive, people don't generally sleep all day on the sofa, otherwise they get nothing done. Uh, they tend to be willing to embrace risk. If they weren't, they would be working for Procter & Gamble or Unilever. So, I mean, there's some obvious things to say about them, but I would say that the thing that jumps out to me most profoundly is uh, that every successful entrepreneur I've ever met, starting with the most successful in the world, when I wrote a series of cases about Jeff Bezos in the early days of Amazon back in the 1990s, is I have never met a more curious subset of human beings. I remember when when Jeff used to come to visit us for four or five years running when I was teaching those cases. I remember one day we came back from class and uh, he was in my office and I offered to go get you know a glass of water, a cup of coffee, and walk down the hall to do that. And when I came back, um, it was as if he was devouring the contents of the office, and I don't mean that in any kind of pejorative way. I mean he was just. He was at Harvard Business School. He was going to learn every last thing. He wanted to know about whether this book was good, that book was good. He wanted to know why, why I was running this kind of software on my computer or my Mac instead of something else. He wanted to know what it was like to interact with students and how we thought about teaching. It was just remarkable. I remember walking out of there after his visit and thinking, that is the most intensely, like crazily curious human I've ever met. 
I think that of all the success factors, I mean, again, you got to be comfortable with risk. You've got to be an optimist. You've got to be full of energy. But wow, if you aren't intensely curious, I would argue that you're just not learning enough about the people in the world around you to be successful as an entrepreneur. Because as we said before, success as an entrepreneur means that you've got to be infinitely flexible. You've got to be learning all the time. You've got to be willing to pivot because you don't know your target to begin with. And if you think you do, it's going to change nine times before you actually get there. Um, you know, what, what I'm reminded of is uh, a European example of this, which I think is very profound. I remember reading an interview that we did at Harvard Business Review. A friend of mine named Bill Daler did an interview with Nicholas Hayek, the founder of SMH Engineering, which ultimately became Swatch. And the interview, of course, was after Swatch had become a global phenom, but before Swatch had saved the entire Swiss watch industry by buying, you know, half a dozen of the major brands. And as you know, Swatch had done a couple things that were industrial miracles. One was that they were building this, you know, 20, 30 million quartz movements at a level of quality higher than what Asia Pacific was delivering at a lower unit cost in the highest labor cost market in the world called Switzerland. Um, and the second thing was the only way you get to those low unit costs at high quality is to manufacture volume. And the way they manufactured volume was using this overlay of intense creativity on top of those watches, you know, where you put a fashion dress on a standard $80, 80 euros watch watch. Uh, you create a fashion collection and every six months you'd kill it and you'd launch a new one. So they had that design laboratory in Milan and it was constant, constant innovation on top of effectively a Swiss industrial miracle. And I remember in that interview, uh, Bill asked him, like, what is what's what's the secret weapon here? And he said, the most the most important thing we do at SMH at that time at Swatch um, is to remind people that when they were children, they had intense curiosity about everything around them. That's how they acquired language. That's how they learned how to comport themselves in the world. That's how they learned how to learn. And he pointed out that when people become adults, they kind of forget that they were once tiny little learning animals, and they were intensely curious little creatures. And he said that the success factor for them, which is in some sense an amazing entrepreneurial story in the context of an established venture, was to take a bunch of folks who thought they were just going to work to do their job and transform that job into what he referred to as an environment in which they nurtured people's quote unquote childlike curiosity and did that aggressively and explicitly and every day. And that, that was that is what drove the creativity and innovation at the strategic level all the way to the design level in the organization, which has created the most successful company in its category uh, in the world, arguably. Uh, I think the curiosity thing is what all great entrepreneurs have in common. And for that reason, uh, how could they not want to learn in a way that was self-organizing and responsive mm -hmm. for the world around them? Perfect. Super answer. I have a dear friend from Ohio, Kyle Roth, and um, he's been asking, Michelle, as you were talking about, um, uh, well, here's the question. Perfect. So what do you guys think? Is there literally a, um, a type of, you know, uh, a, a group of people or country or culture that is like more open towards um, that of a mindset. Um, would you say so? Or is it something where we can say anyone can adapt and learn and become one? Okay. Um, hey, Michelle, can I give the easy version yeah, of that? Sure. And then you, you're going to yeah, give yeah, us sure. the, the graduate program. <laughs> Um, this, you know, the fact that Kyle's talking about not just cultures and demos, but but industries, I'm kind of reminded of that famous observation that Warren Buffett made many years ago, which is that the best kind of business is the business in which you only need to be smart once. You come up with some brilliant product like, you know, I don't know, windshield cleaner for the for your automobile. And it's one formula. It's incredibly simple. You become the volume producer. It's one day's worth of or one one effort worth of innovation, and then you manufacture the profit, the product at a ninety eight percent gross margin for fifty years. And essentially, he's saying we look for businesses where you don't have to be smart every day, like consulting, education, <laughs> being an artist. You only have to be innovative once. And I'd argue that those are obviously a rarity in the world today. But but not being facetious in that kind of business. Why bother with agile learning? Also, why bother with learning? Hmm. I mean, do learning. Let people like go to museums and learn foreign languages, but you don't need learning for the workplace. The problem is that that's the exception these days, not the role among businesses. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yep. Um, yep. My answer to that 
um, we have an intense research field in this, and that's the basic. Uh, it's based on the concept of um, a growth mindset versus a fixed mindset. So they discovered that people are learning really good in terms of you know, a mindset that they are bringing forward is a growth mindset. And within that growth mindset, um, there are different aspects that come together in that person. One being that I'm curious to and open to new things. They were just encountering, looking into that. The second one is that I see failures as a path to learn and not failures as failures per se so you know, whenever i try something i'll just find out okay this doesn't work try differently and then you know, then i'm gonna come there and find that out and um, the other thing is that they define success as trying and trying and trying so ongoing curiosity ongoing experimenting leads to success instead of you know i'm I'm a very, mm -hmm. you know, intelligent person and for that I know something or I don't. So I define myself in terms of being curious and learning on and, 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 and learning as an ongoing process per se. So that's that's put together as a growth mindset. The interesting thing is, and that comes to the question that you've also asked is, okay, am I born with a fixed or a growth mindset? No, we all have both parts. We do encounter different areas where we develop a growth mindset, whereas we all have certain areas where you say, oh, no, not talented. You know, I, do, I, I can't do math or I'm not, no, I'm not an artist or something like that. So your self-explanation. And the question is, how do I learn to develop my growth mindset into areas that I normally use to react to in a fixed mindset? And that's learnable. And if we look at learning ability, young children are our best example. They're curious, they learn fast. That, that's, the, that's the highest learning rate that we have as humans, is as children. And unfortunately, we unlearn that. And that comes also back to the question, do we need to change our, our school system or anything of that? Yes, we do have to, because that curiosity, that trying, that, you know, intense learning path is somehow limited into a fixed system. And that also leads me back to the question, uh, what do we need to build? We need to build an environment where learning and curiosity and anything else is supported as something positive instead of putting them into a fixed frame in terms of you need to sit still, you need to lead the book, you need to do this, you need to do this. So we are creating a fixed framework for our learning from youngest age. So if we want to have agile learners, we need to open that framework and we need to stress the, the, the aspects of learning that we actually want to have as a result. At the moment, we restrict. And that's what we get. We get restricted learners. And if we want to change that, we need to change our environment and we need to help them, you know, become that curious growth mindset oriented learners throughout bigger parts in our life that we normally would have. So, and, and that, that's an interesting thing. I've had an example of, of someone that I've been coaching and, you know, he's been a leader and he said, I have that employee, you know, that employee is there. And he does his work nine to five on the dot. He does exactly what I tell him. And then he goes home. But once he's gone home, he is the founding member of an intense club that, you know, does uh, duff racing. And he is entrepreneurial, you know, he's got energy in that and anything else. And say, see, and that's exactly it. We can't define someone as he is a fixed learner or is a growth but it, the, the difference is where does he generate energy? He does um, create energy in the field where he can be creative, where he can take responsibility, where his passion lies, whereas he's just distributing a complete different behavior in a different surrounding. So it's not per se a person who is X or Y or Z. 
it's the surrounding that we build for them very much shows that what they will then distribute and show us is terms of behavior. Michelle, it's so interesting because I would think if, if I were the employer of this individual, I would fight like crazy to get the version of him that starts at 5.01 p.m., not the version that's in the office from 9 to Excellent. 5. And I think that's, yeah. that's in a sense, some of the challenges we're talking yeah. about here. I mean, it strikes me that, you know, there's been the last few years of neuroscience research tracking brain function over the lifespan. And, and one of the things I think is a very interesting concept relevant to this conversation is the idea that when you're young, you have what is called fluid intelligence, mm -hmm. so raw processing mm -hmm. power. And over time, you develop the brain evolves into something called crystallized intelligence, which, of course, is much more about experience and the residue of knowledge mm -hmm. and maybe even insight wisdom than it is processing power. Um, to some extent, this conversation makes me wonder whether part of the problem that stands in the face of corporate learning, and hence the value of agile learning, is that we're seeing a bunch of older adults who have crystallized intelligence brains designing learning experience for younger adults who have fluid intelligence brains. And that this is the reason we end up with a bunch of L&D programs mm. that are rote and feel hygienic, as opposed to ones that inspire people yeah. to well, for that matter, engage their curiosity, mm -hmm. inspire them to think about a, a learning process or a learning journey that's intrinsic to their work. Yeah. Um, it's probably an even stronger case to do a wholesale redesign, even around that idea, which is what is what is the physiological state of the brains that we are trying to invest in? Mm -hmm. And if so, are we doing it in the right way? Yeah. And it seems to me maybe there's a diagnosis about why Agile makes a lot of sense. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, um, can I just go on with the questions I have in my head? Sure. <laughs> like, um, I've been thinking, um, how easy or difficult are we going to make that for corporates? Um, from the um, from the perspective you guys are describing, uh, I already immediately think anyone would understand the value, and anyone would understand the necessity of it. Now I'm thinking, okay, so if someone says, okay, let's do it, how much work is really behind that? Mm -hmm. Now, let's say, I think if I'm not mistaken, just before, um, like it was probably right after or during pandemic, I anyway remember there was a time where almost every coach and trainer I knew in Germany started to go and pay a couple of thousand euros to become an agile coach because... <laughs> the market was burning for it they were like kind of i know they were like kind of in the uh, automotive for example there were so many projects you had like people going in as agile coaches for many many weeks and train people to uh, you know redefine processes and make them more agile and faster and lean and all of that so when we start throwing into the corporate the word of agile and agile organization would they feel or see the need to um let's say build an agile infrastructure in terms of frameworks and processes and tools if they want to become an agile learner or is it just the familiarity of the word we are using and agile learning in itself is a concept and a mindset and culture but is not dependent on you having transformed your organization into some agile process driven whatsoever mutant. How do you guys see that? Well, um, using agile frameworks doesn't automatically make you an agile learner and an agile learning organization. So that that's not enough. So although learning is implemented in the framework as a little small little part in terms of you know reflecting what we've done reorganizing and doing things like that but that's only a fraction of what we would need as an agile learning culture organization so um using scrum or design thinking or okr doesn't make us an agile learning organization that's that's to say for that okay it helps in terms of a trained mindset in terms of you know that that growth mindset that we might need 
And uh, the agile world normally always comes with being agile before doing agile. So the mindset comes before the frameworks and, and the way that we work within that. Otherwise, you know, you just have a framework and then the mindset doesn't work. And then the framework's just, you know, something rigid that, yeah. you know, puts you into a very rigid structure where, you know, agile frameworks are quite rigid in terms of learning how to do it. But if the mindset's not there, then the whole framework doesn't help you. It's so, funny that, and I think, Michelle, I think you're putting your finger on something that is a real risk, yeah. which is that, you know, everyone knows what it's like to have somebody show up from HR and say, I'm from corporate, I'm here, here to help. Yeah. It's like those are the worst and scariest words in the English language or any <laughs> other language. So, so the idea of showing up with a bunch of new nomenclature or neologisms that, again, sound like corporate doublespeak, mumbo jumbo buzzwords, I mean, I think the risk is that if you are not culturally prepared to embrace this, it's cause to be cynical about yet another mm -hmm. corporate program. That that clearly would be just an awful outcome because it'd be hard to recover from that once the cynicism set in. Mm -hmm. It's interesting. Um, uh, there is a very interesting question from um, Arjun, and um, um, it's uh, it's funny because, and I would like to challenge that question myself before I hand it over to you guys. He's talking about. Ajun is saying he understands Agile as a way of thinking and is um, coming with the question of so how do we cultivate it in a team and how do we monitor it? And I also remember, Michelle, that you and I had the conversation about so once um, such Agile learning concept is established, how do we measure it? I am trying to be a tiny bit of a devil's advocate at that moment, <laughs> thinking if we are talking about this whole agile learning as a culture uh, and we were talking about this entrepreneurial mindset to me it's odd to even ask ourselves the question of how to measure and monitor it because if you are in that entrepreneurial mindset and if it's like the self-motivated learning and self-organized learning then you're already in the game and um, you don't need someone to monitor you or control you to do that because like Beside the technicalities, if you are talking about you need to learn skills and you need support is one thing. But if you have already the mindset and if you understood it's about you taking the decision and look around within your, let's say, team and see what your needs are and what the challenges are you want to overcome. And therefore, you decide how to plan your personal or team for the development, then I do trust in this process and would say it's interesting to measure the outcome in terms of benchmarking and further learnings for the future more than controlling it if it's, um, you know, if people did their job. How do you guys see that issue of hmm. monitoring, controlling, measuring in an environment where we say the baseline is already you guys as individuals buying into that and be self-motivated to do it? So. Um, well. How do you look at this? Um, coming back to agile being a way of thinking, and it's not only being a way of thinking, it's taking responsibility and being self-organized. And that means that the process that we are going through in terms of setting ourselves some goals, working towards it, and also identifying, you know, have you been successful or not? That's stays our responsibility so yes monitor but not monitor through someone else but check with your team or yourself have i reached that goal that i've set there do i have a learning goal did i learn the right way and did i end at the point that i wanted actually to come out yes or no so yes we do need to monitor but we need we need to monitor ourselves and we need to organize ourselves in terms of identifying how we want to do this. So there's no one telling us how to do it. It's our responsibility to identify you know, how we want to do it. So we self-organize and we, self, we, we set our frame ourselves. Mm -hmm. And within taking that responsibility, which is actually then entrepreneurial way of thinking and working as well, because you take it, that responsibility with, into your own hands. Um, so that's the second part of the question. But then uh, I also wanted to know, you know, how to cultivate such a culture within a team. And starting, I would start with something like 
having intense feedback and open feedback have a high psychological safety within your team, which means uh, you know, everyone in the team is able to, to speak up and say what he thinks without having any negative consequences within that team and in our social structure. So that we are able to be open and and come up with anything that's there and also saying, okay, I'll take risks. And if I take a risk and I failed, you know, I'm not being, you know, shot by anyone in the team or the leader, or you know, if there's no leader within the team, but to identify, okay, I'm taking risks is also good. So you'll start establishing that within the team. You know, you need to have some openness, some psychological safety within that, and then um, helping them to identify where they want to develop and what does it take in terms of learning or in terms of experience or in terms of something else. How do we get there? And it's not, it's again, not helping them from the outside to tell them how to do it, but help them how to organize it for themselves and how to yeah. learn a learning path and get within that. And there are some frameworks that help with that, like, you know, a framework that's pretty um, established, like working out loud or something like that, you know, that would help you establish something like a self-organized um, work stream or learn stream or experience stream, and then identify, okay, at the end, how do you don't do this? So helping with self-organization and helping with identifying how to set up my own learning goals within the team or my personal one and maybe have someone around me like someone that's uh, a learning expert giving me help within choosing the right measures that i might have to take but as a coaching function more than someone telling me what to do or how to do it but have your expert on the side but you're staying in charge of your own development path. And that's ex exactly, you know, how you need to start that within a team and how you would you know, incorporate maybe someone like that person that I've just, you know, told the story about. If he would have the freedom to come up with ideas of him and, and, and come within that and have that displayed within the team, then, you know, then he comes also with things that are, you know, close to his purpose and that's where we come back to you know the golden circle questions in terms of where's my purpose where's my drive am i sitting in the right position and mm. that's that's one of the things that also needs to be there so um, beside our structure of self-organization we need to have identified our purpose within the team what drives us what drives every single person within that team that you really want to develop into that so if the purpose comes within that and your your ability to self-organize, then that's something that's actually driving very, very intensely. And that's that makes those teams to high performing teams. You know, there's been interesting studies by Google being made as well. You know, that comes back to several aspects of that. Mm -hmm. so I, 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 Jim, can I take a slightly different, maybe it's not orthogonal, but a kind of yeah, different absolutely. view here? I mean, I, I don't disagree with anything Michelle said, but I do want to, as sort of the, 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 at least the resident a business school faculty member on the call, a business person, you know, it strikes me the ultimate answer to this measurement question, if we're really serious about what we're talking about, which is adult learning professional development in a business context, the ultimate metric is that the business does better. The ultimate metric is that either the CEO or the leadership team or somebody's general manager or the shareholders in the context of a public company conclude that this was an investment worth making. And why was it worth making? Because we actually produced uh, more passionate, more energetic, more capable, more skilled, more insightful, more creative, more innovative, whatever the metrics are, it, they better be aligned with the goals of the business. And so it strikes me that I totally agree, Michelle, that there are a bunch of things that one would need education experts to create a bunch of interim mm. milestones. But I would argue that the biggest cultural challenge here is the leap of faith required by owners, leaders to essentially say, we're going to do something very different with the way people spend not all, but some of their time in the workplace. It in short term is going to cost us because it's going to add either complexity or distraction or just more activity to what is already a challenging situation. 
but we're betting that that short-term cost pays off in the medium and the longer term by creating more effective individuals, but as Michelle said, higher performing teams. And I do think that, that there's a lot to be, you know, there's a lot of, lot of research that supports that, this idea that came out of manufacturing decades ago, which is that every product is a shadow of the organization that created it. Uh, we see that in service businesses all the time. If you have a bunch of people who are frontline service workers in retail or in, in quick serve restaurants who are disconsolate, underpaid, poorly trained and miserable, they will produce miserable customers who are unsatisfied, who never come back again. And if you have a bunch of people who are happy, motivated and highly capable of delivering against the customer's needs, you get higher levels of satisfaction, loyalty, that account retention or less churn causes the business to work better. And so I, I think the, the issue here is, can we appeal to leaders looking at what's best on a human level for their people, but also what's best for their venture? Uh, again, in large enterprise or corporate settings, it's easy to ascribe some number of euro or dollars to a learning and development budget and say it's just the right thing to do, or I don't want to get regulated more than I already am, so we're going to teach a few extra things about something people need to know about, or I'm being criticized because you know we lay off too many people and they don't have any kind of retrofit or retraining for the new economy. But in an entrepreneurial setting, there's nothing like that to hide behind. Like what you do has to matter to the delivery on the mission. And I think that's the big, for me, that's the mindset change, which is to say, and Michelle, you said this right at the outset, it's not, it's not either learning or work, it's learning and work. They are one and the same, and they're one and the same because it is how you deliver on the mission. And that I think for most people does require a leap of faith as well as leadership. Mm -hmm. Yeah, fantastic. This is, um, um, couple of points I need to say to that. Uh, first of all, I definitely agree. I do always remember um, the time I was busy as a um, uh, consultant for transformation. It was one of the most difficult sales because uh, you never know the outcome of that transformation and you only need to take that risk and have that faith and go for it. And you only can measure that afterwards. So I absolutely agree with you. This is something where um, from the leader perspective, I guess, um, if this is not becoming mainstream as of today, people, the pioneers will have to take that risk and say, okay, let's transform our organization in that direction and see if we can speak of a better outcome. The other issue, which also connects to um, uh, a question or point uh, Susanna made, and um, Susanna is so good to see you here. She is one of the most amazing creative minds in Europe, I would say. Um, so yeah, read to yourself. I mean, I think this is an interesting point I'm seeing here um, when I see that question and it's a little bit, I, I immediately connect to it because as we built Neural Jam, we added Leia as a um, test to exactly assess this, go for the values people are driven by at work and their mindset in that terms. and always ask ourselves the question is the the values and the purpose um of and the culture of the individual a match to the organization yes or no and, and michelle my my translation of susanna's question is is the ultimate intervention here to help this individual understand that he's in the wrong job mm -hmm. so yeah i was going to say so <laughs> Who is going to have the longer arm in this one? So is it the organization who would have the bad luck if they lose a great employee just because they, there was a mismatch of culture or values? Or is the, uh, the individual's job to say, well, I'm now entering a corporate environment and my personal values aside, I need to adapt to a culture this organization is offering if I want to be a part of it. So where do you guys see the balance? I know that is not black and white, <laughs> but so. Yeah, well, as I said, you know, if you want to establish self-organized teams with a self-organized learning environment and an and approach, which then comes back to, you know, bigger being an agile, means that that purpose that drive the, the things that drive you must be part of it and that also shows the google study you know if you look at the high performing teams you know one of the aspects is totally is their purpose 
And is, is that purpose, touches my purpose, the purpose of the organization that I'm working for? And if that doesn't match, that is then the answer to exactly that question. So if, if I find another team, and that's something interesting that I've also found out, it's not only the organization. Sometimes it can be changing teams with leaders in terms of, you know, how can I establish something and being able to kind of have that matching uh, purpose coming along, then I would say, yeah, that, that could work as well. But otherwise, if, if the purpose doesn't match and that comes back to the same I, basic ideas of new work or anything of it, it and then, then I would also say then we would have to look at both sides um, to, to find a new position, new job, a new company that fits the, the culture of that person far better than kind of trying to fit into. And the, the problem within that was that that employee wasn't living up to his possibilities and, and you know, could have performed better if he would have had the drive to do so. And that's exactly what that leader you know, was trying to ask mm. me to say, how do I do this? How do I touch that purpose? that I know of that he is, you know, like having tons of energy on the outside of the company. But when he's here, you know, he, he drives on 50%. That's exactly what he said. He drives on 50%. I know his capabilities and, you know, the performance could be like at least 50% better than he shows, but mm -hmm. it just actually doesn't. And that exactly gives you the answer. Mm -hmm. I get it. Interesting. Uh, with Almost like four minutes left. I have one final question um, and time flies. I, I could talk about this like for hours now. Um, so provoking, um, assuming we go in there into an organization and we um, invite them to transform towards an agile learning organization. Is there anyone who is going to lose? Like, is there anyone from the HR or higher management who, because of this transformation, is losing responsibility or authority or power or whatever? So is there anything to consider? Is it anything as a massive change in, an, um, let's say, people development area or HR area? Can we say such a thing? Or even at the higher management level? So is there any hidden... hidden uh, you know, risk uh, for the for the top level people if they transform their organization and enable the the mass to become more proactive and entrepreneurial. That's what I'm saying. Because obviously, the more you enable the the, the mass, the the less um, at the top you can then dictate and drive. Jam, maybe I can jump in quickly just to say yeah. that, you know, one other reminder of, of what we've learned in the software development world is that, you know, is that Agile operates inside something called the Scrum Framework. The Scrum Framework is a framework for team participation. So as much as we will talk about individual development in a learning context, in an Agile context, the people go off and do stuff as individuals. But the whole point of the Scrum thing is they come back together constantly as a group or a team. Mm -hmm. It is not it doesn't work very well to be a dissident to that process. You'd be dissident to where it's going in terms of the development, but you're not dissident to the process. And the other implication of the Scrum framework is that a whole number of decisions about responding to the market, responding to new data, taking new directions in development, pivoting, that all of those are decision rights that are pushed down to the team level. So to the extent that, yes, you have learning and development czars who are playing a command, who are playing a command and control game, with their big budgets against a bunch of individual learners, I think we're talking about regime change. Awesome. And, and justifiably so. Sounds sounds really good. You know, hearing this, I finally um, get it confirmed more than ever that the idea of building the infrastructure of NeuroJam was the right thing because it was all about this collaborative learning and all about this collective intelligence. And it's interesting that you create this bridge of while it is about the individual development of, of people, at the end of the day, it only starts fruiting when it comes back together as a team. Um, we have one minute, and I see Susanna had one last point. So maybe I throw that in and have this as a closure of our conversation. Here we go. Um, 
You want to come to say you want to interrupt? Yes. So what do you guys think? <laughs> well, um, agile mindset doesn't mean I have to work in a fixed and controlled framework. The, the pure ability in that lies that I am able to create my own framework. That means self-controlled in a team together, you know, learning together, have that social connection and anything else. And I've seen a lot, a lot, a lot of companies transform without any of those fixed frameworks, without Scrum, without anything else, but just developing the concept of self-organization, of they're being self-responsible within their team, have teams that run together, that work together, and they create their own environment, the environment that they need. And they take responsibility. And the, the thing is, those teams are highly successful. So they even, you know, if you look at um, intense um, consulting companies that are uh, more in the figure and fact side, even they identified in a lot of their studies that agile organizations that have a agile culture per se are far more um, uh, successful than the traditional companies and that shows if you're able to unleash creativity and you know entrepreneurship in terms of taking over ownership for my own decisions and anything like that and you're being able to act fast with good results and that's actually what we want to achieve within that learning process then you're far more on the success side than your fellow companies that still work in a very traditional dream, uh, framework of, of you know hierarchies and and um, all the different standard ways how an organization is normally structured awesome thank you so much um thank you michelle thank you jeffrey thanks for everyone else who is here um uh listening to us watching that sharing their thoughts it was amazing it was far too short for my taste um i will try to repeat that actually more often and um, use uh, your time and expertise more often both michelle and jeffrey that was really really insightful thank you very much for that um with that said um let's bring that to an end uh, i look forward to our next call and um to everyone who is watching this, you guys have our contact details. So if there are any questions, uh, any ideas you want us to uh, have a, a deeper dive on, just write to me and I'll uh, tackle that and we'll see each other again. Thank you very much, everyone. It was great having you. Thank you. Thank you, Jam. Thank you, Jeffrey. Have a great day.